using a lot of these concepts behind volumes and surface area and arc length, we can solve several different physical applications. Today, we're going to take a look at work and force. We're going to answer the question, how do we calculate the work done by a force? And we'll start simple and kind of build to the more complex. We're going to start by first talking about the fictional one-dimensional objects. And how we can calculate the mass of this one-dimensional object, how much stuff is stuffed into this one-dimensional object. And the idea behind this is we're going to have a thin rod on the x-axis. So it's this long, straight, skinny thing. It's so skinny, it doesn't have any width or depth. It just has length. It's just one-dimensional. And it's going to be over the interval from A to B. And rho, that's a Greek letter rho, looks kind of like a P. Rho of x gives the density of this rod at the point x. It turns out that the mass of this rod is the integral from A to B how much stuff there is underneath this curve of the density rho of x dx. So the mass of a one-dimensional object is simply the integral of the density function. So for example, if I have a rod over the interval from 1 to 3, where the density is given by rho of x equals 2x squared plus 3. If I wanted to calculate the mass of this guy, we would simply need to integrate over the distance from 1 to 3 of that density function 2x squared plus 3 dx. We should be really good at this. We end up integrating, we get x cubed, 2x cubed over 3 plus 3x integrated from 1 to 3. Plugging in our limits of integration, 3 cubed is 27. 27 divided by 3 is 9 times 2 is 18. Plus 3 times 3 is 9. Minus, plugging 1 in, we get 2 thirds minus 3. If we run that through our calculator, we'll get 70 thirds for the total mass of this function. Now, one dimensional uh, objects aren't real, but they can give us an idea how the more complex two dimensional functions work. We're going to work with two dimensional circular objects or disks. Kind of like a CD, if you remember those. If I have a two-dimensional circular object with no real width, it's just two-dimensional, how do we find its mass? Well, similarly, we've got a function. Rho of x is the radial density. of the disk, the density of that radius with radius r. Then the mass equation is simply 2 pi. It's a disk, so you have to see pi in there, right? Times the integral from 0 to the edge of the, of the disk, the radius. And now, because we're in two dimensions, we have to account for x and the, the x distance the, that we are away from the axes times the density function dx. So in two dimensions, if we're looking for the mass of our circular disk, we'll have 2 pi 
times the integral from 0 to r of x p of x dx, or rho of x dx. So for example, what we're talking about there is if rho of x equals 3x plus 2 is the radial density of a disk, with radius 2, we're going to find the mass. Well, using our equation, mass is just 2 pi times the integral from 0 to the radius, 0 to 2, times x times our row equation of 3x plus 2 dx. Or if we distribute that x through, we're really taking the integral of 3x squared plus 2x. So that's going to be x cubed plus x squared. Oops, don't lose the 2 pi out front, though. 2 pi times x cubed plus x squared integrated from 0 to 2. Plugging those limits of integration in, plugging 2 in, we get 8 plus 4. Plugging 0 in, we get 0. And that's 12 times 2, or 24 pi for the mass of this two-dimensional disk. Let's extend then to another application, and that is the work that is done by a spring. The work done to stretch or compress a string, a spring, first off, in general, the formula for work is going to be the integral from a to b of the force that's applied. So specifically in the context of a spring, we know that the force is equal to some constant that varies based on the spring times x. So that means work for the spring is going to be the integral from a to b of kx dx. Now, a couple notes on springs. We must be in feet and pounds, or joules and meters, depending on which units we're in. If we're not in the correct units, you do have to switch the units. Also, A and B are the length of the stretch. Not the length of the spring, but how far the spring is being stretched. So let's see if we can solve a spring problem. Let's say a spring has length 50 centimeters. And it takes 3 joules to stretch it to 60 centimeters. We want to know how much work it will be to stretch it from 60 centimeters to 70 centimeters. It was 3 joules just to go from 50 to 60. Would it be 3 to go from 60 to 70? Well, let's see how it works out. First thing we're told is we're told the amount of work, this is the work, used to stretch to 60 centimeters. So from 50 to 60 centimeters, we're actually stretching from 0 
to 10 centimeters. That's the actual stretch. Those are our A's and B's. But the problem is those are in centimeters. So when we change those to meters, we divide by 100 from 0 to 0.1 meters. So our work is the integral from 0 to 0.1 kx dx. Evaluating this, keeping k as a constant, we end up saying that the work is k over 2 times x squared integrated from 0 to 0.1 or 0.1 squared times k over 2 or 0 0.005k. And this is interesting because they actually give us the amount of work. We said it was 3 joules. So 3 joules must be equal to 0.005k. And if we divide both sides by 0.005, we find the constant, the stretch constant for our spring is 600. Notice we had to first find the stretch constant for the string before we went to answering our question. Question wants to know how much work it's going to take to stretch it from 60 centimeters to 70 centimeters. Well, actually, from 60 to 70, 60 already is an increase of 10 centimeters to 70 is an increase of 20 centimeters. But we need to change that to meters, so from 0.1 to 0.2 meters. So we're integrating from 0.1 to 0.2 times our constant, which is 600 x dx. And now this is the integral we need to solve. x squared divided by 2 leaves us with 300 x squared integrated from 0.1 to 0.2. So we have 300 times 0.2 squared minus 0.1 squared. And when we do that, we end up with 9 joules of work to stretch from 60 centimeters to 70 centimeters. So it takes a lot more work to stretch because we're further down. There's more tension on the string or on the spring when we're going from 60 to 70 than when we're going from 50 to 60. All right. Now we're ready to get to the real good problems. And that is the talking about the force of water. And to set this up, first, in general, force can be calculated as the density of what's pushing against it times the distance it has to travel times the volume of what we're taking the density of. When we're talking specifically about the force of water, we can know that the density of water is equal to either 9,800 newtons per cubic meter or 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, depending on if we're in the metric or SI units. So let's do a couple water force problems. First, what we're going to do is we're going to pump water out of a tank. Let's say we've got a cylindrical tank. And it has a radius of 3 feet. It is 10 feet tall. The water itself is not full to the brim. The water is 2 feet down from the top. 
which means six feet from the bottom. What we need to do is take all this water, and we're going to pump it up and out of the cylindrical shell. We want this cylinder to be completely empty. Well, let's give it some dimensions. Let's say this top, we're going to call that top x equals 0, the bottom x equals 10, which means where the water stops is x equals 2. And we're going to just take one tiny disk out, kind of like a CD. It's so thin, it's just going to have width of dx. If we just look at the amount of force it's going to take for that disk to be pumped out of this cylinder, we'll use our force formula. First, the density. That's water. We're in feet. So the density is 62.4 pounds per cubic feet times the distance that it has to travel up. So x started at 0. So whatever x is, that's going to be the depth of that disk. So if x is 6, we're 6 feet down. If x is 3, we're 3 feet down. But whatever x is, that's the distance. That disk has to be pumped up and out. The volume of that disk, it's a cylinder with a tiny little height of dx. So volume is pi r squared, pi times the radius of 3 squared times the height of dx. Well, simplifying a bit, 3 squared is 9. And 9 times 62.4 is going to be 561.6 pi times x. That's what's required to pull out that disk out of the water, to pump it out of the tank. Now, we don't want just that disk, but we want all of the disks from a depth of 2 all the way down to the bottom a depth of 10. And we know to do that, we need to integrate from a depth of 2 to a depth of 10 our expression. Let's pull the constant out, 561.6 pi times x dx. So we have 561.6 pi times x squared divided by 2 integrated from 2 to 10, which is equal to 561.6 pi times 10 squared is 100 divided by 2 is 50 minus 2. And this we just have to plug into our calculator. And when we do, we get a total work done of 26956.8 pi. So about 26,000 pi, almost 27,000 pi foot pounds. Let's take a look at another example using water. This time, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the force against a dam. Let's say we've got a dam here holding back water. It's a small dam. It's 10 feet long and only 5 feet tall. And actually, the water itself on the other side is starts one foot down. So there's only actually four feet of water pushing against this dam. We want to know how much force is actually being pushed against this dam. Now, we remember we've got this equation that the force is equal to the density times the distance times the volume. So if we take a sliver like we did before, a really skinny sliver of width dx, for our density, we're still talking about water. And water has a pressure of 62.4. 
the distance that we have to travel, if x is 0 at the top, we're 1 foot down. So we're off by 1. We lose 1 foot of water at the top. So it's not just going to be x. But we need to subtract off the 1 foot of the dam that's not actually putting any pressure on the wall. So we'll call it x minus 1. And then we multiply by the volume of this uh, strip that we cut. Well, this strip we cut has a distance, a length of 10, and a width of dx. And it only pushes on two dimensions, only on that rectangle. So we don't have to multiply by anything else, just 10 times the dx. And so when we simplify this, we end up with 624 times x minus 1 dx. That is the force against that little tiny strip. Of course, we want all the strips from 1 foot down to 5 feet down. So to get that, we'll take the integral from 1 to 5, pull the constant out, 624 times x minus 1 dx or 624 times x squared over 2 minus x integrated from 1 to 5, which is equal to 624 times, plug in 5 in, 25 halves minus 5 minus, plug in 1 in, 1 half plus 1. And when we put that in our calculator, we end up with 4,992 foot-pounds of pressure against this dam. So we've looked at several different physics applications here today in this video. Take a look at practicing some of them on the homework assignment. We'll talk about them more in class, and we will see you then.